Good evening and thanks for coming. And in order to make this uh, new council legal, we're going to have to have a swearing in. The swearing in will be done by Supervisor Don Rao, which is here. And I will introduce the new members and the old members to you right now. Gail Swarick, you can raise your hand. From she's, a ch she's our chair and she's representing Morongo Valley. Stand up as I read, as I read your name. It'd be great. Okay. Right. Pat Flanagan, the vice chair representing Desert Heights. Mary Hel Helen Tuttle, secretary representing Copper Mountain Mesa. Steve Reyes representing Wonder Valley. Ellen Jackman representing Joshua Tree. Tom Zegart representing Yucca Mesa and Steve Bardwell, which I don't see Steve here right now. Oh, there he is. Uh, you snuck in. Steve Bardwell representing Pioneer Town. Now I'll turn it over to our supervisor, Ralph, to swear again. I just want to thank you all for dedicating your time and coming out to serve our community. Morongo Basin is better because we have voices like you that come and dedicate the time and, and the effort to communicate back to the County Board of Supervisors. So thank you very much. Now if you'll raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies foreign and domestic and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's really great to see such a crowd. I wish we had this many people at our Morongo Valley CSD meetings. Uh, and please bear with me. This is the first time I've, I've been in this position on this board, so I may have a few quirks, but I'll get through it. Thanks. Um, adoption of agenda. Has everybody had a chance to read the agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, it is my sad duty to ask for a memorial adjournment for Art Munoz. Um, I don't know if any of you knew him, but uh, the people in Morongo Valley were very lucky when Donna was our general manager. He was there all the time with her, and he it will be greatly missed in Morongo Valley. So could we just have a moment of silence, please? Thank you. Uh, public safety reports, County Fire, Scott Tuttle, Chief Tuttle. All right, is the mic on? Yep. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Tuttle, Battalion Chief of San Bernardino County Fire Department. Uh, just going to go over a couple things. First, the call reports for the last month. 
and then a quick little public safety reminder. Uh, first, all of our calls for the month of April. Johnson Valley had nine calls. Joshua Tree had 148 calls. Landers had 41 calls. Pioneer Town, seven calls. Wonder Valley, 14 calls. And Yucca Mesa, 26 calls. Um, I'd also like to just talk quickly about the telephone emergency alert system that we have, also called Reverse 911. Um, this system is basically set up in a database at the 911 centers so that if there's an emergency in your neighborhood, we can call your home phone and tell you about this emergency. Wildfires, earthquakes, flooding, whatever. The one thing that it doesn't capture though is cell phones and any phones that you have that are voice over internet phones, digital phones. So to get that information to those phones, you need to register those phones. So you can go to our website at www.sbcfire.org or you can go to the sheriff's website at SB, or www.sbcsd.org or you can go to the county's website at sbcounty.gov. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. Yeah, www.sbcfire.org. Is there a tab for registering? Yeah, on the front page, there's a, there's a button that says uh, a telephone alert network. All right, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Do you share the phone numbers with anybody? No. No, they stay in the database at the 911 centers. Yes. Scott, uh, campfire burning, what's the status on that now? Uh, I think Cal Fire areas are still open burning, and, uh, and the county areas is open burning as well. You still need a burn permit. You still need to call the phone number on the burn permit. There are all the rules and regulations are on the burn permit. You can get them at your local fire station. They're free of charge. It basically is just a way to let people know what the rules and regulations are and give us a call before you start burning. That way when your neighbors see smoke in your backyard, they call 911 and we know that you're, that you're doing a, a controlled burn. So. Yes, sir. Who do we ask about the status of the Panama Heights fire station? Uh, regard, well. That you would have to talk to your, your local rep. I mean, it's already, it's, it's a done deal. The, the Board of Supervisors decided to, to make it happen. Um, it's, I don't know what the timeline is for it to actually move into the next phase, but we're currently moving our stuff out of the, the station. Yes, ma'am. I believe that the camera could not pick up David's question. Could you, like, refer back to what you <laughs> Okay, yeah. So the question was, what's the status of the Panorama Heights fire station? And as many people know, that station has not been staffed for more than 15 years. Uh, rather than just let it go vacant, the county decided to use it as a homeless day facility to help people, you know, get back on their feet, give them some food, give them a place to take a shower, get cleaned up and give them some resources to get off the streets. So that's, that's about all I know about as far as what the facility is going to be and what it's going to offer. But yeah, it has not been a fire station. It has not been an active fire station for more than 15 years. Yes, ma'am. With your emergency alert system, so many people only have cell phones. Is there any uh, chance that they will be included at some point? Yes, that, so the question was for people that only have cell phones that don't have a landline phone in their house, that's the main reason why we started this system, is so you can register your cell phone. Because the cell phones aren't registered in the 911 system because you could be anywhere with your cell phone. The system was originally designed to target your house, your address. So it would call your phone and tell you what the emergency is. What you do is you register your phone, your cell phone number, to your home address. Then it knows what your physical physical home address is anyway. So if there's an emergency in your neighborhood, it will alert you. Yes, sir. It has to do with uh, fire protection number five. 
uh, as the point is right now with the uh, renovation on the unincorporated areas, we're paying out of our property taxes at least 120 some odd dollars for fire protection. So with uh, fire protection number five, they're talking about another $157 cut change for fire protection. Right. What is your explanation on that? So where do you live in Morongo Valley or or do you live where do you live, sir? I'm sorry. Because it, it's different. So the whole Bronga Basin will have FP5, fire protection tax number five. It's $157 a year. The only area that's not included in that in our area is Morongo Valley because they have their own fire tax down there. So everywhere else, if you had another fire tax, then it's gonna be it's gonna be taken away and you're just gonna have the one fire tax, the FP5. So you won't be paying. You, you mentioned 120. You won't be, if you're paying that now. You won't be paying that and the 150. Just the 157. Yes, ma'am. The fire number for Joshua Tree would you consider 148 pretty typical or a little higher? Yeah, that's that's about normal for for the Joshua Tree area. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Morongo Valley Fire um, CSD Fire Department, Chief Yearsley. Good evening, everyone. Um, we were up about eight calls from last month. We had 53 calls, 18 of them for ALS Medical, 17 for BLS Medical, five fire, five collision, three hazmat, and five other. Um, I just thought I would um, make sure everybody knows, I know CAL FIRE's put tons of ads on the radio and everything, but for defensible space in our area, there's a lot of rural area with a lot of brush and shrubs and grasses, uh, clean them back best as possible so we can not have too bad of a year this year. Any questions from anyone? Okay, thank you. Good evening, my name is Drew Smith. I, uh, I'm a captain with CAL FIRE uh, locally here at Drew Smith, Captain Drew Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm stationed at the station across the street from the Vons here in Yucca Valley. Uh, just to build on what some of our cooperators have uh, talked about, it is getting hotter and uh, we do have a significant amount of growth in the area. As we all know, you guys have looked out in your property you guys have driven around and you've seen how much uh, grass is growing and how the fuel continuity is everywhere. Now, uh, it's a good thing and it's also a bad thing. So uh, fire safety is, uh, is, is what I'd like to talk about, what I'd like to push to you guys. Uh, as it gets hotter, as it gets drier, it's going to get windier and we're going to have fast moving fires. Hotter it gets the more this is going to happen. As it is, uh, we have been running some starts locally, uh, both here and in the Lucerne Valley area, all the way over to the Feenland area. And, and what, what I'm leading up to is, is, yeah, we've had a significant amount of rain, so there are some spots that aren't primed to burn, but it's slowly transitioning. And uh, an example, down in Morongo, uh, Little Morongo Canyon's had about uh, 12 inches of rain. And uh, that's, that's on the higher side. It's not out of normal, it's on the higher side. Uh, coming over here to Joshua Tree in the lower base, all through here, looking at between six to 10 inches of rain, which is enough to support this kind of vegetation, which is enough to support fire spread. And that's with the small light fuels, and that's the stuff that's growing around your home. Uh, to build on that, we have been doing fire inspections in the area, in uh, Morongo, Landers, Pioneer Town, Joshua Tree, this whole, this whole area. And what we're inspecting for is uh, 100 feet of clearance around your home and overall fire safety. Example, if you have limbs hanging over your, your fireplace or your home, that's the stuff we're gonna try to educate uh, the residents about. 
clearing around your propane tanks, having addresses visible, and the overall fire safety of your home uh, from the wildland point of view. Um, we have, we're doing it with, with our engine, and currently we have one engine. Come about next month, we're gonna get our second engine on, online, so we're gonna have two type three engines ready for response in this, in this community. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, two vehicles, you'll see them out in the community, that are doing inspections. Um, in addition to the, uh, the growth, we also have snakes too. And uh, we've been hiking a lot. We've been uh, seeing the areas, and I've ran into three snakes so far. Uh, fortunately, all three of them have been harmless, but that's something that, to uh, think about when you're clearing the vegetation around your home. Uh, try to avoid uh, snakes. Try to avoid mechanizing equipment on a windy day when it starts getting hotter. Um, and also uh, be mindful of the heat. You know, we're used to the cooler weather. Now it's starting to get hotter. Uh, be mindful of that. Stay up on your hydration and be safe. Uh, someone brought up campfire permits uh, and burning conditions. Uh, yes, we are still issuing burn permits, and uh, uh, there's two different sides of this. There's the, the burn permit side, the residential burning permit from 6 a.m. To, to noon with some restrictions in there. And then we also have a campfire permit, which is uh, exactly that for warming, cooking, ceremonial purposes. And there are some uh, restrictions, and there also is a lot of personal responsibility with that as well. We can't deny you a warming fire, but if it's 110 degrees outside, it's not exactly a warming fire, is it? So if it's windy outside and you have a campfire, and it's gonna, and you run the potential of uh, setting the hillside on fire, burning your neighbor's house down. Uh, that's where we have to step in. So yes, there are restrictions to it. Uh, uh, responsible campfires is what uh, what we're promoting. Uh, you can come by my station, and we can issue one, or you can go to a website. Website is Prevent Wildfires uh, CA dot org, and uh, you can get a campfire permit that way. You can come by my station. And if you want a, uh, a burn permit, and that's a four by four burn pile uh, from 6 a.m. to noon, you can come by my station on Airway Avenue and I can issue you a burn permit. Now, we are gonna be uh, suspending burning soon with, the, with, with everything I talked about, how it's starting to get hotter, starting to get drier. Uh, I foresee about two more weeks and then we're gonna suspend burning. Uh, as it is, just to to reflect on this, uh, in the whole Yucca Valley area, we're at a medium dispatch level. So our, our organization, uh, based on fire severity, uh, will go low dispatch level, medium dispatch, or high dispatch level. So, so now we're entering the medium dispatch level. An example is Big Bear has low dispatch level. Uh, Apple Valley has low dispatch level. So over here we recognize it as, as a higher fire potential. So. I predict that we will be su suspending burning soon. Uh, any questions at all? Right here in front. Is there anybody within the fire, any of the fire organizations that actually has an approved need abatement resource or contractor that serves this area that would be able to contact? We don't. We don't dive down that, that path because uh, we, we set the standard, we set the guidelines, and we'll let the local community uh, figure out how to do it. Uh, so we don't, we don't recommend a contract or anything like that. Uh, that that's kind of on the other side of it. Uh, I can't speak on behalf of my cooperators. Maybe they can, they can add to this. Yeah. 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 Right here in front. Yep, yep. Uh, is that just in your areas and the county still permits a six foot in diameter fire when you burn the whole brush and stuff like that under a permit? So with, uh, with our responsibility, state responsibility area, I can issue you a permit under a certain guideline, so a certain weather conditions, can exceed four by four and two feet high. So there are some restrictions with it. Uh, there might be other areas that, that have a different different permit process. 
but in, in state responsibility areas, that's what we do. Four by four, two feet high. Ten feet. Yep, ten feet. And now, now, you can have a little bit of growth. Uh, the reason why you run into ear, to uh, erosion issues, but it's generally two feet of reduced vegetation. And when you get right up to the tank, you want it completely clear. So ten feet around, reduced. Anyone else? Yep. Talk about that's that's what we're looking for so so if you think about it in rings almost like a target so closer to your home the the, the more you want to remove right Please. so uh, the closer to your home the more uh, you know you want you want to clear uh, and now as you go away from your home, you want to remove it to the point where you have a hundred, hundred foot of clearance around your home and the last, say, uh, 30 feet would be reduced. So yeah, it's still cleared, but it's, uh, it's, it's almost like you're reducing the fuel continuity around it. And example, an example. So let's say you have a, a, uh, uh, a large ornamental plant, like a sage or something like that or fern out there. Uh, they burn fast, they burn hot, but they're also, some of them are natural growing here. It's not practical to remove that, but you can cut around that and, and remove the fuel that could burn up to it one and a half times around it. And now you still preserve your privacy. You can still use that as a windbreak and it'll help out with erosion. So there, there are a lot of rights here, but the whole concept of 100 feet around your home is, is, is what, what we like to talk about. Anyone else? Can you elaborate a little bit on the warming fire? Okay. Um, I went online and got a permit. I think it was talking about more like if someone goes out and lights a fire in the woods or something, you know, camping out there. But if we're like around the house, if someone's having a fire, chimney, or what is there permits required for that, or what are the specifications and permits for those? Permits? Okay. Uh, there, there's kind of two different sides of it. If you have a permanent um, like structure, or uh, you buy one from Walmart got a lid on it's got a screen around it uh, you don't need a permit for that if you have a permanent enclosure so you got rocks around it and a gas line pipe to it right very permanent on your patio right you don't need a permit for that it's set um, what we're issuing is a campfire permit that you can have on your property or you can have in a designated camp area not just open land right in a designated camp area uh, that has 10 feet of clearance around it and has a, a rock ring around it or some kind of barrier around it. Usually you have some kind of hole so, uh, to, to help uh, contain your fire. And uh, there's some other restrictions too, or, or I guess recommendations, like uh, having an adult present at all times and uh, two means of extinguishing it. So, so on your side with your residential side, let's say you wanna have a warming fire tonight. Uh, so you can, you can take the online uh, a questionnaire and they answer a few questions and you can print out a permit that doesn't relieve you from uh, the responsibility of of, uh, of of burning so so we'll still enforce negligent burning um, yeah so let's say there's a vacation rental home and there's other yeah. guests that are there like yeah. what uh, what kind of information do they need to apply for a permit they do they do each, each yep Now, if it's fixed, you don't because that's okay. permanent. You have a you have a permanent area around it, and um, and that's 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 fixed. Uh, if you just go out to the back of your property and put some rocks around it, some lawn chairs, uh, that's one you need a permit for. If you go outside your property in a designated camp area or designated uh, area where you can have fires, you have to have that same kind of kind of uh, structure. You know, ring okay, clearance. Then. And then do the burn bands, do they affect those like fixed ones with the, you know, closed mesh ones or those? No, they don't. Those nope. Our, our burning restrictions won't, won't affect those. Okay. But on the flip side, if we have, if we have heavy winds, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't exclude negligence. At the end of the day, we're, 
we can't deny a warming fire, a cooking fire, a ceremonial fire. And but if I show up to your house and it's it's 30 mile an hour winds, I'm I'm going to shut you down. And uh, and that's that's just the right thing to do. It's for your neighbors, for your community, all that stuff across the board. That that's just how it works. So. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. and, uh, Our, so, so yeah. is, is the 4x4, four four, is that a you know, campfire type thing and there's a different environment for brush? Or is the brush still a 4x4? Four four? Okay, if, if we're going down the the, uh, the fuel reduction route, so you're, you have trimmings from your property that are natural growing, and you're going to burn those instead of take them to the dump, correct? That's right. Okay, um, it's still 4x4. Four four. Now you can have multiple piles. But four by four, we identify that as, as a general man, a manageable size for across the board for, for everyone. So you could have three or four manageable size four by four piles uh, with plenty of clearance around it, with adult presence, two means to extinguish it. And with the permit, 6 a.m. to noon, completely out by noon, you could, I think, responsibly manage to reduce your vegetation uh, with, with multiple piles that are small. So, so what we don't want is showing up to a property and they're strip burning the whole thing, and like, and they tell me, "Oh, I got it, I got it," which is not not uh, that's not responsible for for the community around you. So four by four. Yep. Where I live out in Desert Heights, it's 100% annual growth. Uh -huh. plant. So it's that annual growth that you would like to see. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we can drag. You can drag it off. You can uh, weed it. There's a, there's a lot of rights. Yeah, you can sort of pull it off and leave the seeds behind. And, yeah. Yep. Just some, some work. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Luke Niles. I'm Luke Kenna here at our Morongabation Sheriff Station. First, congratulations to all the newly appointed delegates. Thank you. Um, it's our first meeting, so I'm not going to inundate you with a ton of numbers and all that stuff. We can go on about numbers for months. But let me just give you kind of a recap of what a typical month looks like for the Sheriff's Department patrolling our unincorporated county areas. So last month, we responded to about 1,600 calls for service, which is pretty much on target for the average month. Um, last year's statistics showed in this area, we did about 21,000 calls for service. Um, all in all, our, our part one crimes, and just to give you an idea, part one crimes are bad crimes. This robberies, the murders, rapes, assaults, Burglaries, as the law currently defines a burglary, those are our type one crimes. We uh, last month we had about 75 in the unincorporated areas. That's that's pretty much standard for what we've seen the last five years in law enforcement in California. Each year there's been about a two percent rise in the increase of violent crimes. Our area is not exempt from that statistic. It's pretty much the standard throughout California. Um, and that's kind of where we're sitting with it. Um, you, everybody knows, you know, uh, OHB is, is a, a, I won't say the word nuisance, but it can be a community problem no matter where you live in our unincorporated areas. Fortunately, we, we've been very lucky, lucky, and in many years we've had a grant to supplement the patrol needs for the year to service the OHB problems in the area. That's been the current standard. We, uh, 
I've applied for it, and very likely we're going to receive on par funding for our grant to continue OHV patrols through this next year. The, the grant also funded a, a really nice four seater patrol, whatever you get, the utility off road vehicles that's going to help our off road teams a lot in the next year. Um, it was delivered a few weeks ago. It's being outfitted with all the lights and sirens necessary to deploy here in the next couple months. So if you see some new fancy looking four seating weird sheriff's patrol vehicle, it's legitimate. It's actually now a, a cop car. You will see it out there. Um, but that's kind of the gist of where we're at right now. Does anybody have any questions, ma'am? I do. Um, so as a representative for an unincorporated area, that means there's lots of land. And we don't have so much an OHV problem, but we're getting a grow problem. People are, uh, so if I, so what do we do? You can smell it. What do we do? Absolutely call us. Um, and, and, we ha and we do need to know about them. Uh, the laws are a little different, so our approach to that situation is a little different in modern times. We ourselves have to do a lot of research to determine if it's legitimate, if it's not. Um, and then we, we have the benefit being the Sheriff's Department. We have a marijuana team. They patrol the entire county. Um, and if, if you've seen recently in, in our local medias, um, the marijuana team was up everywhere in the in incorporated areas. They also spent some time in both of our contract cities. And, and we got rid of a total of, of nine illegal marijuana grows. But those are ones that had been reported to us. We had done our research, determined that they were in fact not legalized. Then we had to you know, gather our assets to properly deal with it. So. I only half answered your question. No, Sorry no, about no, that. I, I but I kind of thought as much. So, so when we call, we wouldn't expect you to come fire please, in the right way, of course. What, how long, what is it, a couple of months that you guys need to research? Because I, I do notice that you do it all at once. Yeah. In, blow them all down. And in, in it, the answer could vary. It, it could be that the one you're calling about might be the fifth one and our team's already assembled to deal with four other ones, so we just add that one onto the list. You could also at that time be calling about the first one we're aware of. Um, so the research might take a little more time and we might combine our efforts with a few other ones we've heard about. So I can't give you a great answer to say one month, two months. The reality is um, the amount of time we get to put into researching it is dictated by call volume. So if something more pressing, one of those part one crimes occurs, we have to reallocate resources to invest in investigating that crime. And then we come back to the marijuana type crimes as we can. Thanks. Certainly. Yeah. Do you happen to know the name of that uh, grant that you mentioned? Do you use a fancy cop car? Oh. If not, uh, no, not off the top of my head, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sir? New traffic enforcement. Alta Loma, 75th, 75th, Friendly Hill High School, Friendly Hill Elementary School. Why are two of the three stop signs invisible? So it, it's a good question. And in the unincorporated areas, we do team up with the highway patrol the best we can, especially in the areas around the schools. Um, the reality is the highway patrol does traffic enforcement in the non-incorporated cities. So they spend the majority of their time doing those enforcements. Those problems we try to work with and sign issues. Um, some fall under the auspice that the county might be able to help us out with it. Some is Caltrans. Oh, certainly. Well, thanks for bringing it to my attention. Actually, I'll, uh, I'll bring it up in our meeting with them this week, and we'll see if we can't get it. I assume it's more uh, more on the times when 
daylight hours when the schools are in session? Is that when you're noticing the problem? All the time. Okay. I live right there. Okay, perfect. Yep. Ma'am? It's the off highway. This is the name of the plan. Off highway. Off highway motor vehicle recreation <coughs> grant. State of California. Awesome. I half thought Pat would know, but I didn't want to put her on the spot. <laughs> Ma'am? Can you tell me what this new vehicle is intent is to issue citations, make arrests? Well, these vehicles, can be any or all of those Yes, any and all of them. <clears throat> really, to approach the OHV problem, if we're going to use the term problem, is, is as much about education and trying to get people to understand that when they're visiting our area, they haven't truly driven to the middle of nowhere. We live here, we have, you know, and, and truthfully, what we encounter more times than not are people unaware of the problems. When they're educated and they're told of proper riding areas, they will move on. So in those situations, yes, education. There's other people that just, don't get it. So that's more targeted enforcement. <clears throat> if we're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time to find them. So the whole gamut you suggested, this vehicle will augment our <laughs> motorcycles that we currently deploy out there. Sir? Is there is there an airspace flight that I have over my property? And this is in reference to drones. Um, because my concern is if I, if I see a drone, what what law am I going to break if I blow it out of the air? <laughs> Please don't blow it out the air. I can't tell you what your defensible airspace is, but discharging a firearm at it will probably cause us all more problems than it will actually solve for us. Um, drones are a new thing, and honestly, we're in talks. And, you know, there's a lot of base area that actually exceeds beyond the base that's protected airspace. There's airspace over cell towers that are different. So I can't give you a simple one answer that says 100 foot directly in a column over your house is your space. Um, that would be really irresponsible of me because I just don't know the answer to that. But drones are a problem. Generally, we've been kind of lucky and we can track a lot of drones back to where they're flying them. And again, educate people and just the basic common courtesy to your neighbors not to do it has solved a lot of problems. It doesn't solve them all. But firing the gun as much as our instincts might work might want us to do that, we'll probably get us all in a little bind. I have answers for you. Does the FAA states that any personal aircraft is illegal to fly over residential area? You're not allowed to shoot down. Can, can you speak louder? Because the FAA states that any personal aircraft is illegal to fly over residential area. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Ma'am? Um, I don't, um, I guess because CHP is not here, I'm not sure if this is appropriate for you or even for them. Fire Just um, in Joshua Tree, that, um, I'm, I'm sure this is been talked about before, perhaps another stoplight kind of near where people are always getting hit by cars. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, so just throw, exactly. <laughs> I know it has been mentioned, yes. <laughs> Sir? <coughs> is it legal to grow marijuana in San Marino County at all? Yes. Under <coughs> so is there an amount or a number of plants or a It's or what? six plants <coughs> per per person. Yeah. Well, that's Say that again. Six plants per person. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ma'am. Um, do, when there's a traffic accident, do you go as well as the CHP in the accident? We do not 
have jurisdiction over accidents that occur in the unincorporated areas, but we have a wonderful partnership with the Highway Patrol out here, so it would not be uncommon for you to see us handling a, a traffic accident if they're tied up in other investigations just for the basic concept of public safety. Okay, and, and my other question that tags on to that, is there a certain thing that triggers you to make a report? A friend of mine was in an accident in Costa Mesa, um, and her car was totaled. And the, whoever came to take to see what was going on, because she reported that nobody was hurt, they did not make out any report. Is that the same thing that goes on in our area? No. Per se, no. But what they did wasn't necessarily wrong either. If a traffic accident occurs, all you're obligated to do is exchange your personal information with the other driver. You do not need a police report in California. You do have some reporting requirements to the Department of Motor Vehicles based on the value of damage to your vehicle. Right. But there is no legal requirement to have the Sheriff's Department or Highway Patrol come out for a non-injury traffic collision. Okay, if, it w if, you, if you call in and you say you're not sure if you're injured, then would a report be made? So in our county, if you call the Sheriff's Department, we're going to come and we're going to take some type of a report. Okay. Now, this is kind of a weird distinction because there's what's called a report and what's called an investigation as it relates to motor vehicle collisions. Anytime there's a visible injury, law enforcement will do an investigation. If there is no injury or a complaint of pain, the only requirement is a report if someone really wants it. But in, even in those situations, you are not required to have a police report. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sir? Joshua T. Downtown has a big loud music. People play music up to 1 a.m. I had recorded that and I made 13 complaints for the neighbor. One time he sent guy a gun. I involved the FBI and the guy never got caught. And you have room for loud music outdoors. Up to 600 people. I made duties. If I can send you. So that maybe has a, a a few distinctions. First, let's just say if it was your random neighbor in his house playing music and he had a party and it offended you and it's something you needed to call the sheriff's department for, we will respond. It will be responded to in the priority of all the calls in the county that may be occurring at that moment. And I, be, just being honest with you, it generally starts at a lower priority call. So, could be lucky and there could be no high priority calls and you may find us there in time to still hear it and to deal with it. Um, I don't want to fool anybody in the room. I think we know what the reality is. It takes a minute for us to get there for those kind of calls. And either then the music's down or gone, or even the people who have called have gone to sleep. Um, we will try to make contact with the person who makes the call to find out if there was more to the story than the simple report we get initially that it was just loud music. But oftentimes it is gone, the situation resolves itself, and there's not much we do about it at the time. The other flip side of that is there are events that take place. I mean, we've all seen Joshua Trees become a very popular destination for a lot of folks. Well, we do, uh, it permits our issue for a lot of people to have different events that come with music. When you have a permit, there are situations where the decibel level of those permits might allow them to play louder music for a little bit longer than the average county ordinance permits. I know I use the word permit a lot of times there, I don't want to confuse you. But so that situation is slightly different, and when there is a permit, and somebody's acting within the guidelines or parameters for that permit, there's not a lot we'll be able to do in those situations. Thank you. 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 Th
Um, now we have a presentation by Kurt Sauer and Kathleen Radich. Did I pronounce Radnich? Um, Joshua Basin Water District. A brief presentation on the current condition of Joshua Basin Water District. Good evening. So I'm Kurt Sauer, the general manager of the Joshua Basin Water District, and um, Kathleen. Where's Kathleen? As our public information officer, you uh, more than likely have seen her at the farmer's market every Saturday. And if you have questions, uh, she's a good person to contact. We also have uh, President Johnson of the Board of Directors in attendance and Director Luckman. And we have Assistant General Manager Mark Ban. Uh, and then, if I didn't miss anybody else, we have two of our Citizens Advisory Committee members, Tom Flown and Sherry Long, uh, so, and Gail Austin. <laughs> so, if you have any burning questions and I can't answer them, uh, you can go talk to them. I'm not sure. So, how many people in this room get your water from Joshua Basin Water District? Okay, keep your hands up. Now, the board members, Put your hands down, okay? No, keep your hands up. All right. There are about three times as many people at this meeting than come to our Joshua Basin Water District board meetings. So I don't know if we need to have, you can put your hands down now. I don't know if we have, need to have concurrent meetings with the, with the MAC to improve our turnout, but we meet the first and third Wednesdays of every month at 6.30. So for a riveting time, you should come there. Um, okay, so the state of the water district. Here's what I have to tell you. I have nothing exciting to report. The water is still coming out of your taps. The quality is good and the dependability is good. So that's the end of my presentation. Not really. All right, I, what I want you to know is, is we have, we had uh, 31, excuse me, 23 permanent employees. Uh, in January of 2017, the Board of Directors, and we have a very active, very involved Board of Directors and a Citizens Advisory Committee, uh, they passed a rate increase for five years, which enabled us to generate enough revenue to start actually replacing our main lines, rehabbing our reservoirs, and miscellaneous other ac activities that are going on, and we have Instead of hiring it out to a contractor to replace our main line, we have hired five employees for our capital improvement replacement program. And it's funded in a way through this rate structure that it will go on for at least the next 10 years. So Mark, 24,000 linear feet for Saddleback. All right, sometime in June, we've already acquired all the equipment that we need. We're in the final throes of hiring the last four employees, and sometime in June, we will break ground on the Saddleback Mainline Replacement Project, the first project that's been, the mainline project that's been done since 2007. And we're already planning the next project for the following year, and so you are going to be seeing a lot of new heavy equipment in the neighborhoods uh, for the next 10 years, and mainlines will be replaced and some of you will be getting notices that say your water is going to be shut off for the next four hours or we're shutting your water off tomorrow for the next X number of hours. Um, so just that's, that's what's going on. Okay. Um, we have an excellent customer service staff. Peggy and Lisa lead the way. We are open from 7.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon, Monday through Thursday. And we are available for emergency response to leaks, et cetera, 24-7. Um, so when Kathleen and I were talking about what should we be covering, Kathleen said, well, why don't you try and fix some of the misconceptions? And I said, I'll be there all night. <laughs> so we've narrowed it down to a few, and maybe you'll have some other interesting questions. The building boom. We keep hearing that 
There's not enough water for all these new people. The park visitation has gone to three million and they're getting all the water for free and they're depleting our aquifers. Well, when you look at the numbers from 2016, 17, and 18, we sold 44 new meters, okay? From 2008, 2009, 2010, we sold 38 new meters. So the number of new meters that are coming in are not really that high, right? All the water that is being used up, it seems like there'd be a lot of water being used up because there's all these people. But our latest conservation figures show that the amount of water that we're producing, let's see, this is May, so April. So in April, the water, amount of water that we pumped out of the ground was 32% less than the water we pumped out of the ground the same month in 2013. Our year-long conservation rate is 22% less water than what we were using in 2013. So the people are conserving, they're improving their irrigation systems. I don't know what they're doing, but the amount of water that's coming out of the ground is actually less than it was five, six years ago. Um, so in, in addition to that, as part of this rate increase from 2017, the board authorized us to move from recharging 500 acre feet, an acre foot is one foot of water on top of a professional soccer field. They used to use football field, but people don't know what football is anymore. It's more like soccer. So 500 acre feet was what we started with in 2014. By 2020, we will be putting, 2021, we'll be putting 1,000 acre feet of water back into the aquifer as part of the state water project. We actually pump 1,100 acre feet out of the Joshua Tree Basin, subbasin, a year. So by 2021, we will be putting about as much water back into the aquifer as what we're pulling out. And the water quality of that water is just fine. And it does not contain chromium-6, okay? so. Uh, that's tourism, the building boom, commercial. Oh, the commercial businesses get cheaper water. And, and uh, the National Park Service gets free water. Those are incorrect. The National Park Service has a meter up at its entrance station, and they are charged the same four-tiered rate as you are. And all of the commercial businesses downtown are all on the same commercial tiered rate as you are. So there's no price breaks for the commercial folks. There's no price breaks for the national park. Uh, already covered conservation and recharge. So development. There's been this ongoing discussion at the Joshua Basin Water District by the public that comes in and wants the water district to stop any development. We are not a land use agency. That is the county. Our job is to deliver water, to sell water that's safe to drink. So you've heard of, have you heard of the 58 Airstream glamping proposal? Okay, on Sunfair in 62, right? Sunburst in 62. We have enough water for those 58 Airstream trailers to be used as rentals for camping, okay? We had, you've heard of Altamira, David Fick is here. We had enough water to serve the 248 homes, right? If we didn't have enough water for Altamira and we didn't have enough water for the 58 Airstream glamping outfit, then we wouldn't have enough water for 58 additional homes or 248 additional homes. So we don't, we are prohibited from restricting our water sales to projects that the community doesn't like. It doesn't work that way. That's the county, right? So maybe that's why you don't come to the water district meetings. <laughs> You're preoccupied with county meetings. <clears throat> yeah, so. Can we respond? Yeah, let me just throw one more thing in, okay? okay? Well, actually, sure, go ahead. So when you have condensed residential homes, so what they wanted to do up there, 
all on septic, you need to be concerned about the nitrates and things that are going to go into our groundwater. So that is a concern. Okay, good point. Nitrates, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If Altamira had gone in, they would have been required to put in a wastewater treatment system. Uh, package plant is what you might know it as. And that treats the water and reduces the nitrates in it to below state levels of 10 parts per million. The same as the hospital. They have a wastewater treatment system. The hospital is someplace over there. Um, so uh, if, if the 58 airstreams were producing 10 or greater equivalent dwelling units worth of effluent, basically 10 homes worth of effluent in a cluster like that, they would be required to put in a, a treatment plant, okay? So we've got the wastewater treatment strategy, which we are in the process of revisiting. It's a nine-year-old document, needs to be updated. Um, so we're gonna be re reviewing the wastewater treatment strategy, so you might wanna come to those meetings. Uh, we're thinking about having a, just a workshop for the public about wastewater treatment. It is a fact that the downtown area has a higher level of nitrate in the water table than Copper Mountain, uh, Friendly Hills, well, upper Friendly Hills, um, and, the, and the other dense populations. It's been there so long with water being used for 40, 50, 60 years that the effluent from that septic tank, all those septic tanks, has reached the top level of the aquifer. But by the time you pump the water from the first 20 feet of the aquifer with all the other water that's pumped from 450 to 650 feet below the ground, it comes out um, well below the state level, but it's still four parts per million when it should be, should be two. So if we have continued development in downtown, all of those that exceed the 10 EDUs effluent level are going to have to put in wastewater treatment facility, package plant. It's pretty expensive. There's a brewery that's being proposed and uh, they have put in at least, well, there's a pilot program that they're using with assistance from Metropolitan Water District to fund it through this organization that they're using that uh, will treat all of their effluent down to less than 10 parts per million of uh, nitrates and then they'll put it in the ground through seepage pits. But if there's another new restaurant that comes in, just to get David excited, I'll suggest that Applebee's is gonna come here. <laughs> Applebee's, Walmart, all of those folks would have to put in a pack, package treatment plant. Okay? We are in no danger of having to put a sewer, sewer in and a sewage treatment plant like High Desert and like 29 Palms and the Marine Base are currently discussing. That is years away. But the better we do now with treating our effluent in the downtown area, the longer it's going to be before the Colorado Regional Water Quality Control Board comes and pays us a visit. So does that answer your, your question? Yeah, it's dense, densely, pop, densely constructed residential areas that are greater than 10 equivalent dwelling units will have a package plant. So, and I would be in big trouble if I didn't cover this before I was done. And that is emergency preparedness. Okay, Kathleen? All right. Okay, good. All right. So how many of you have AT&T coverage on your cell phones? So what was it? Thursday night? Thursday night, Friday morning? No phone coverage, right? I was reading some of the comments by the public about What's going on with AT&T and they're not doing it? Well, you should have a landline as a backup. Oh, we don't use landlines because we're under 40. When the earthquake comes, when the earthquake comes, 
your cell towers are going away. And the county's not, or the fire department's not going to be able to call you and notify you that there is an earthquake, but you'll know, right? <laughs> the water system is probably going to have some significant impacts. Your fuel supplies, all these gas stations that we have, the trucks that refill their tanks are coming up the grade. They're not going to be coming up the grade. They're going to be coming from Phoenix, maybe, okay? So emergency preparedness is about planning for all of these different events that we know are coming. You need to have enough water. You need to have a way to purify it. You need to have enough food and, and a way to cook your food. So we continually harp on you to be prepared, especially for water. But the same thing is going to happen with electricity, with natural gas, and all those other things that we have just become so accustomed to that when our cell phone goes out for 12 hours, you would have thought the world had ended. I just went out and lit my warming fire and <laughs> waited for it to come back on. So, all right, so emergency preparedness. And um, this fall, for the fourth year, we will be doing three tours of the water district. It's about a four hour, it's a three hour tour, but we all come back from it. It's about four hours. And we will take you and show you all the intricacies of how your water is pulled out of the ground, distributed, and you'll get to meet some of the people that, that uh, bring you water on a daily basis and a consistent basis. So state of the water district is good. And if you, unless you have any questions, I'm done. Yes, Gail. that you're um, taking your water from has it gone down at all <clears throat> okay yes so there are two aquifers right in town here on the south side of the Pinto Mountain Fault where the old elementary school was built right right on top of the fault okay the Joshua Tree subbasin is south of the Pinto Mountain Fault the Copper Mountain basin is north of the fault Okay, so we're drawing water out of two different aquifers. 1,100 acre feet comes out of the Joshua Tree subbasin. Serves 80% of the population. Okay, so up from the 1960s until 2014, on average, that water, you know, the level in the aquifer was being drawn down on average a foot a year. So we have drawn our aquifer down over 54 feet. And it was getting a little bit higher, but now we're conserving water and we're recharging. So instead of going down a foot a year, it's now going down about six inches a year. And, but you know, remember, it's, it's difficult to measure the level of the aquifer 470 feet below the ground. So it might be eight inches, it might be four inches, but over the last five years, it's been on average six inches instead of a foot. And the Copper Mesa aquifer is drawing down at three inches a year. And because of our geology here, we have very low risk of subsidence. If you're concerned about lands collapsing because so much water is being drawn out, we have, we have a different geological formation. It's sandy rather than clay. And so uh, subsidence is not a problem. Landers is subsiding at 0. 0.0004 inches a year. So, that, you bet. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One, the recharge pond right now, does that only recharge one aquifer? Yes, the Joshua Tree Subbasin Aquifer. So the other one is not being recharged at all? Right? No. There is, there is US, there are USGS studies that imply that there's about 100 acre feet that are going from the Joshua Tree Subbasin into the Copper Mountain Basin, but those are estimates with a lot of scientific extrapolation. Okay, and then Chrome 6, update on that. I may have the years wrong. In 2014, I think the state 
established a, a maximum contaminant level in drinking water for chromium-6 at 10 parts per million. Prior to that, the EPA and the rest of the country had 100 parts per million. In California, it was 50 parts per million for total chromium, chromium-3 and chromium-6. California, being the lead state that it is, decided that 10 parts per billion, million was the new standard. Well, they were challenged in court because the state's required to do an economic feasibility study for any of these new regulations, and it was shown that they did not do an adequate economic feasibility study. They didn't have to prove the health part. They just had to prove the economic feasibility. So the court threw out that regulation and ordered the state to come back with a new uh, maximum contaminant level for chromium-6 based on not only the health standards, but based on the economic viability of areas like us being able to afford to put them in. So they've not come back. They're not even, well, so they haven't come back yet. I would expect sometime in the next year or two, the state would come up with a new maximum contaminant level for chromium-6, and then we will have X number of years to fix our problem um, or be out of compliance, and you will all get a boil order that says that there's chromium-6 in the water. So one or two years from now, What's our level currently? it ranges from 12 to 44 at our five different wells. So if they come back with a new economic feasibility maximum contaminant level of 25, then two of our wells will have to be treated and three won't, or three or two, something like that. So it's, it's there. I will say it's naturally occurring. It is not from any industrial spills. Um, so not that it makes any difference. It's still chromium-6. And if you really want to uh, fix the, your concern about chromium-6, move to a different state, and it'll be 100 parts per million, and then you'll be safe. <laughs> Gail. Um, could you please talk a little bit about your um, help with, with uh, still paying uh, the water for low income? The low income? OK. <laughs> Last. Last August, the board initiated a low-income assistance program. And if you are at or below 200% of the national poverty level, you are eligible to get a low-income assistance uh, credit of $50 off of your bill annually. Okay? So you can go online, you can come into the office, or you can call United Way of the Desert, and they're managing this for us, along with six other water districts in the Coachella Valley. Um, so if you are low income, 200% below, 200% uh, or below of the federal poverty level, then you can get up to $50 a year credit, don't get money, credit on your bill. So the board mm, put $6,000 into this assuming that maybe 100 people would apply. I think the latest number, and this is May, so whatever, nine months, is 45 people. In a community that's 30% at or below the poverty level, we're, we're just stunned. So if you know somebody, or if you are, uh, somebody that falls in that category, just be aware that there's a low-income assistance program. And uh, it's a real simple form to fill out. You can do it online. Send it to United Way. Every year, once a year. So what happened? Let's see. Where did we go? I think it was Coachella Valley Water District, and we went down and met with them. They started at 50, and they had 28 people. And Coachella Valley Water District is huge, and they only had 20, 28 people apply for it. They sent it out in, in two or three different languages. Uh, still nothing happened. They raised it to $100 a year, 
and they got like 150 people to apply. So maybe we're going to raise it to 100 bucks. Um, maybe we're going to leave it at 50. That's up to the board. And those monies, uh, we can't, we cannot give a customer uh, mm, credit or money from other customers' fees. So this is coming out of the property taxes that are collected. Great. It's about as riveting as your finance committee meeting. have reports from our MAC members on things that are going on in their community. Um, let's start with Steve Reyes from Wonder Valley. Um, good evening. My name is Steve Reyes. This is my first meeting I'm in Wonder Valley. There's a total of uh, four events coming up. One is on the, two events are on the same day. On May 18th, um, you're going to be living with snakes put on by a retired park ranger, uh, Jane Fox. It's going to go from 11 to 1 p.m. It's really interesting. I went last year. A lot of families went. Uh, Tuesday, May 21st, there will be a USDA food distribution starting at 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then on Wednesday, May 22nd, there will be a Salvation Army food distribution from 11 to 1 p.m. And that same day, the Monroe Basin Healthcare District Medical Unit will be there from 0900 to 1 p.m. All at the community center. All at the Wonder Dog Community Center on Amboy. Next, we're going to have um, another Steve, Steve Bardwell from Pioneer Town. Thank you. Glad to be here, serving on the serving on the Mac again. Uh, the big news up in Pioneer Town is the water line that is underway. It's now about oh maybe a little more than halfway up the hill from Yucca Valley into Pioneer Town. <coughs> the uh, contractors putting in, I must say, are doing a really excellent job. They're really very good as you see the quality of work that they do. This, uh, this water line is, as one might expect, triggering a lot of interest in growth up in that area. Uh, there's recently been a proposal to, for a 288 uh, acre parcel, which is up to the north and east of Pappy and Harriet's, and this developer is looking to put in a uh, about a hundred over a hundred unit development there kind of a kind of a campground resort type of development uh, there's a question is they sh they should not be able to tap into to put their straw into this water line but it is still uh, remains to be definitely determined on that in addition there's a 35 trailer 35 trailers uh, are being proposed to be placed on a only a one and a quarter acre parcel right in Pioneer Town proper. So there's a lot of lot of pressure is beginning to to, to beginning to re reveal itself with this water coming in. Uh, there is a a meeting that is scheduled for June ter June 3rd by the special districts uh, who are overseeing this water district. And at that time, hopefully, they will be providing some uh, answers as to who can and cannot uh, uh, hook up to this uh, to this water system. But also in other places up within uh, within the Pioneer Town, there's a lot of growth, and I find it kind of striking when you look at the countywide plan uh, predictions for how much growth is going to and they're planning for out within this area. I think that their predictions are, I'm sure their predictions are way, way under what's happening because I know just up from us, up uh, Gamma Gulch, there's six, at least six new homes that are being built up there. Uh, so there's a lot of, a, a lot of growth and pressure for growth up there. Um, Pioneer Town is not as with many of these other communities having a, their own community center, so I'm not able to say that we, we don't have a venue where a lot of these uh, a lot of venues uh, or a lot of these events might occur so I'm just able to as I sort of piece together information as I pull the various uh, residents up there and I'll try to present it to you but 
Thank you very much. Um, next is Tom Siegert from Yucca Mesa. That one? Okay. Hi, just uh, one item that uh, was, was something we, we're, uh, we had this, this month and we'll be having uh, again. The Andromeda Society, I don't know if you are, are, are aware of that we have a uh, regular uh, star party uh, for families. Uh, the first one was held uh, for this 2019 spring and summer season on May 4th. Uh, and it started at 7 p.m. If uh, you're interested in, uh, in just coming and having some fun and looking at the stars, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good place, it's a good time to have. And we do that at the Yucca Mesa Community Center. We also have uh, potluck dinners on the fourth Friday of, of, of each month. Uh, and it's a good place to come and just uh, meet your neighbors if you live up on the Mesa. Thanks. Mary Helen from uh, Copper Mountain Mesa, and we have been fundraising like crazy trying to save our kitchen. And the most exciting thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a Memorial Day barbecue, but it's going to be on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. It's 10 bucks a plate. I got tickets if you want. And uh, we're going to have music. We're going to have alcoholic beverages. We're going to have, uh, it'll be a cash bar. And um, uh, Mac's going to be making ribs. So we would love your support. We have uh, an August deadline for our kitchen. So we're hustling. We're baking and cooking and selling whatever we can. So come help us. Thanks. Next is Ellen Jackman. Hi, I'm Ellen Jackman, um, <clears throat> representing Joshua Tree. Uh, I've been in the desert for 10 and a half years. And Immediately when I came here, I was really impressed by the level of activism within this community um, on many issues and from all viewpoints on those issues. And I knew that it was the kind of community that I wanted to get involved with. Um, so to that end, I'd like to thank Supervisor Rao for the appointment. And I would just like to say that I'm here to be, uh, I'm here to listen and to learn and to hopefully be a, a good representative for Joshua Tree and make good recommendations. Um, I've already heard from several um, of the residents in Joshua Tree um, voicing their, um, their thoughts and insights on areas of concern for them. Um, probably of no surprise to all of you, um, some of the areas of greatest concern would be the short-term vacation rentals and uh, the, the increased traffic due to um, increased visitation to the park. So um, I'm new, so be gentle with me, but definitely talk to me and let me know what your thoughts are. Thank you. Uh, hello, and um, I definitely have a report. I don't know how many of you were able to pick up this um, little handout in the front. Since um, 2016, many of you were aware of the Bureau of Land Management West Mojave Plan and off-road vehicles within our area. And we all spent a great deal of time. Some of us spent more time than others. Took quite a lot of recovery time commenting on every single little outlet that they had within our area is transportation management area three. It includes Wonder Valley all the way up to Homestead Valley. Um, this handout has a map at the top, and this will, uh, can we put it on the uh, MAC? Yeah, that we can put this on the MAC website, and also it'll be on the Mojave, or the Morong Basin Conservation Area website. So uh, I tried to put together in one page what the new WEMO Transportation Area 3 Alternative 5, which is the preferred by BLM, would mean for us, and I have to say, they worked with us. It's not terrible. It's shockingly not terrible. All of the CSAs within our area, all of the BLM land is motorized, street legal only. So that's, if you are living in a CSA, there's no longer off-road vehicles allowed on BLM land. If you're not in a CSA, such as 
Desert Heights is not in a CSA. What we have is motorized with no sub-designation, which means that you could have off-road vehicles on it. However, every vehicle on there is subject to the county off-road vehicle ordinance and code. So there's no free rides. And uh, Wonder Valley began a process working with the county and developed signs, a picture of which is right here, that they have, I think, six of the signs in Wonder Valley. And do they seem to be working? It's very clear. Um, there is no designated off-highway vehicle riding areas or trails in the Morongo Basin. Pretty clear. Persons found operating off-highway vehicles on any road, including unpaved roads, could be issued a citation per County Code Section 280403. Off-highway vehicles traveling through the Morongo Basin must be towed. How do you like that? And. Um, so there's a few things that we are working with BLM on, but I'd say that we're in pretty good shape. And um, some of us are going to continue to write letters. That's, what is it, a 500 page? 591. 591 pages in the um, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. And so everything, of course, isn't perfect. But do look at this. And if you want to look at the maps and you want to get in touch with us because you find something that's um, difficult, the website is right here. The easiest way to do this is to Google Community Off-Road Vehicle Watch, the CAL website. The first paragraph, the last word in the first paragraph is uh, highlighted here. And that will take you right to the website. And then the maps are listed over on the left. Uh, the signs that were put up in Wonder Valley, if a community should want a sign, they cost $183 installed. And Mark, can, is that my correct? Uh, we will provide the template, and they have to take it to a sign company and install it. Oh, okay, so that's changed, that you can, you provide the, and so we have to, if you would, if Public Works was providing them, but they're not going to do it anymore. That was a one-time. Okay, all right. But the template is good, you get it made, you pay for it, and you put it up, and it's legal. So, um, you will also find on these maps these thin red lines that look like hair, and they, um, are called, you're going to love this, transportation linear disturbance. Say that five times. <laughs> what it means is that all of those dirt roads that they were putting routes on the last time that were just made by people, those are no longer BLM routes. They ticked those off. Those are gone. And they need to be, you know, they're also not going to rehab them, but if they're not driven on, they can rehab themselves or people can do it. But they're no longer out there for writing on. And um, so what it says in their document is transportation linear disturbance identifies human-made linear features that are not part of the BLM's transportation system. These disturbances may include engineered or planned, as well as unplanned single and two-track linear features. So that's their definition of it. So instead of having over 10,000 miles of off-road riding, which they did with the previous one, for the entire um, BLM West Mojave area, and we're just a portion of it, that's down to 6,000. And we have, do not have any um, of the motorized ATV, UTV within our region, or with our TMA, none. So it isn't that you're not going to have any trouble because people are used to riding out here, but the sheriff can work with you, and also you can get the template for the signs and work with your neighbors, raise some money, and have them put up, and then you, they, and get them good and sturdy metal 
that kind of thing. So any questions? Yes. The, the, the C, oh, community, community service area. So um, Kermongro Valley is a CSA, Wonder Valley is a CSA, huh? A CSD? Okay, where's, yeah, so, so it's really, when you look at this, you see all the pink that says, okay, we listen to you. They also listen to the fact that they, we have this really weird land use pattern because of the Small Tract Act, where we have five acre parcels, you know, sort of spread around, and so they, some of them, they sort of let, okay, now you can still get in there. But uh, they tried not, they, they didn't do what they did before, like you write up and then jump the parcel and then write on and all that stuff. Yes? So when does this rule take effect? Is this different? Uh, because last year there were some riders, county sheriff came out and said, well, that's the road. If it wasn't, we wouldn't do anything. But, uh, this, um, all of the county, all of this is under the county off road vehicle ordinance. So, and the sheriff, you can work with the sheriff on that. He understands that. Um, the final record of decision will take place in October. But legally, they've just gone with what legally is for us. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's a learning curve for others like the sheriff deputies. Is that it? Okay. Um, Gail Swart, Morongo Valley. Uh, I don't have a lot to talk about tonight. We had a, our uh, firefighters auxiliary had their casino night, Saturday night. I had wished that we had had a meeting before so I could have told everyone, but maybe next year. And it, went, it was very successful and the auxiliary made, raised this money for our fire department. Um, I don't know what the totals were, but we had a good crowd of people and they all had a really good time. And our supervisor, uh, Ro came with her daughter, and it was wonderful to have them there, and we really appreciate that. Um, I think for this month, that's all I have to, to say. If anybody else, I've got some of these, now it's time for public comment. If anybody else who hasn't given me one will give it to me, you will be called. And I think you all know you have three minutes, and, and Mary Helen will keep you informed. <laughs> Um, Ken, sit. Sites? Yes, sites. Okay. Uh, is it on? No, it is on. Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Sites, and I live in Wonder Valley, and my wife, Teresa Sites, was the MAC rep here, and she couldn't be here tonight, so I'm reading her comments. So. I'm sorry I couldn't be here tonight, but I'm on vacation and won't be back until tomorrow. I'm very happy that the MAC is back up and running. First, I want to say what an honor it was to serve on the MAC these last three plus years. I, love meeting, I loved meeting and working with everyone in the community and, and am so grateful for that opportunity. I am now working as the coordinator of the Wonder Valley Community Center, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time. When the MAC was being reformed, Mark asked me to reapply and I declined. I wanted to step aside and let someone else from the community take the position. I'm very happy to say that Steve Reyes stepped forward to take on this task. Steve has a background in public service and attended our community meetings regularly, even stepping up to share his expertise with the community. And more importantly, Steve loves Wonder Valley. He travels into our outback with friends and neighbors to show them the profound and innate beauty of our area. I'm excited to work with him in building a future for Wonder Valley. Thank you, Steve, for stepping into this position. And thank you all for continuing with the MAC. Teresa Seitz. That's it. Everyone. I'm from Josh. Okay. I'm from Joshua Tree and public speaking's very uncomfortable for me, but especially, you know, during meetings and um, 
and I like to hear what others have to say. But um, first, thank you all for um, restoring the Mac and, um, and getting a chance to meet you all representing the different um, count the different areas, but um, I would think it's more desirable and effective to have um, five or so members from each community like it was in the past, but we'll see. I'm glad to have you all here. And um, there is many areas of concern here in Joshua Tree, and as a resident, I ask that our supervisors, Planning Commission, Land Use Services Department, and the county honor and uphold our Joshua Tree Community Plan. The citizens of JT held numerous meetings spanning months and years creating the plan with the community input, studies, and facts, and it was drafted into a comprehensive plan by a group of dedicated citizens as part of the plan. And I thought that as such, community plans are legally adopted um, land use documents. So as we all know, San Bernardino County being the largest county and encompassing such a wide range of geographic areas and populations, what works for one area um, doesn't always work for another one, hence the need for specific plans. Communities have the right to the implementation of theirs and shouldn't be subjected to decisions made by the county that are sometimes condescending to outside interests and in conflict to our plan. Many projects that have been approved and others under consider consideration have negative long-lasting impacts on our quality of life and the environment, including our national park to which we are a gateway community. So please consider these points and make your decisions accordingly. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I just uh, wanted to make everyone aware about something that's going on with some of our our wildlife here in the area. Um, I don't know if you can see this map, but it's pretty simple. Um, 247, the, the 10 is here, the 62 is here, and this is the road um, up to Pioneer Town. Within this area, there's been a bighorn sheep survey. Uh, normally, the, the uh, wildlife biologists expect to see over 200 sheep there. Now, this year, the, the survey they did in March, they only found 60 and they found 21 carcasses. And this is all having to do with uh, the bighorn pneumonia that's being, the respiratory illness that's being transmitted from domestic goats and sheep. So, this area right here, bounded by Yukaipa, bounded by Morongo Valley, bounded by Pioneer Town, there are a lot of little hobby farms and things like that. So I believe the California Department of Fish and Wildlife are saying that they are going to come out here and produce some literature just about the bighorns in our area, educational literature to distribute. But in the meantime, carrying this information forward, if you have any friends and neighbors that can possibly educate a little bit about uh, small livestock management practices, please be aware that this is happening. Thank you. David Fick. David Fick, Joshua Tree, and this podium should be about another five or six feet forward. I could almost push it, but um, um, several things. One, um, hopefully Joshua Tree doesn't have enough water for Dollar General, but unfortunately it does. I was going to tell you, um, as they build this, it's a very big disappointment for almost all of us in Joshua Tree. Uh, then one thing you're going to have to concern yourself with is it's going to be now dangerous to be around Sunburst and the highway. For people who don't know, the Dollar General, as planned, does not have entrance from the highway or Sunburst. There will be 500, approximately 500 left turns at uncontrolled intersections per day at that place. 
And so you have people coming down Sunburst and they're going to pop out from commercial and the other street is on the highway. So that is going to become a traffic problem. Un, well, I can't say it was unbeknownst to the county. The county was told about it and the county just said, screw it. So um, now uh, I've been a Joshua Tree person a long time, about 34 years. So Ellen wants to catch up with me on things happening. Uh, the Panama Heights Fire Station, that was, well, it's a long story and I won't get into it, but the Panama Heights Community Association donated the land for that. They fundraised $15,000. They spent about $200,000 to build the station. And then because we, Panorama Heights Community Association, protested and uh, stopped the cell phone in 2005, the fire people decided to kick us out by saying that we needed insurance, which was about eight or 900 of a year back then. And so we were kicked out of the place we donated and built. As far as what it is now, the community is going to have to have contact numbers for the group that runs that, which is FAP. And uh, there's going to have to be contact numbers given to the neighborhood. And we want to know the regulations pertaining to that facility because it's, although the homeless do need help, the problem is you're attracting the homeless to Panorama Heights. And when that happens, we're going to have problems. So the people should be uh, able to contact the proper people to enforce the regulations. And uh, well, I'll leave it at that. But uh, you know, it's been an up and down for the last couple of months. Uh, we had the Altamira situation go on. Janet might be able to tell us more about that. And that's the high. The low is the Dollar General. And well, we also have JT Solar. So who knows? Thank you. Steve Tuttle? My question was answered, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, Ed Ballerin. I think I spelled, pronounced that right. Ed Valorant, I've got property in various different communities up here. Uh, I have a couple of requests for the board to maybe add to the agenda to consider going back to a 6.30 start time, which used to be the start time. You have people that have to come in, you know, get off work in Wonder Valley, Morongo Valley, you know, and drive up here. 5.30 is too early, in my opinion, for some of these people to make it here. And, you know, this is a, I haven't seen anywhere near this many people here before. Another question is uh, maybe once a year have a meeting out at the three major points, you know, uh, maybe have a meeting that is hosted by Morongo Valley once a year, by Wonder Valley once a year, by Johnson Valley once a year, because it's quite a distance for those people to come in. And in a lot of cases, they don't show up here you know, because of the, the distance. Another point is that the public comments used to be at the be beginning, and in a lot of cases, some of our public uh, people would be leaving before we got to the public comments. And so if you had something for a fire or uh, the sheriff or the CHP, if your public comment was at the beginning, they had some time to think about it and maybe addressed it when they spoke Another thing was that the Morongo Basin Ambulance used to come here and give us statistics. I would like to see them be added back into the presentations. And a fifth point on, uh, you know, the panoramic height thing. Uh, there's a different board that controls the, uh, the uh, Morongo Basin Transit Authority, and they have a board that would have to approve. But, you know, maybe we could ask them with it being a done deal to have a bus stop put in front of that place for the people to uh, travel there. And uh, that's basically all I've got. Thank you. And uh, I didn't run over this time. <laughs> Marquis, is it? Marquez. Marquez. Oh, there he is. One 
Elmer Hiss, uh, Sunfair community of Josh Creep. Uh, for those that don't know, the Sunfair area just uh, west of uh, Coyote Dry Lake. Uh, I'd like to uh, compliment the uh, the community that uh, all these uh, people that were uh, appointed to the uh, Municipal Advisory Council for the Morongo Basin. Um, my comment it has to do with uh, the community of Joshua Tree, uh, the Joshua Basin Water District. Uh, we have uh, the manager is going to be retiring, I think, in uh, September of this year. And uh, we're going to be getting a new general manager at that, that, uh, that time frame. Um, I've been uh, accused of uh, being uh, detrimental to the uh, community since I've been living here for 18 years. Uh, I had uh, people from the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, staff, and uh, the board of directors uh, being uh, Comp not complimentary towards me uh, as far as uh, my comments uh, of the water district. And uh, we're really concerned about uh, the people in the Johnson Basin Water District not being involved with the water district and it's uh, going forward with, uh, with uh, whatever uh, the communities uh, want to do and uh, I won't go into the details. But uh, I, would, I would encourage the people in Joshua Tree to get involved with the water district because majority of the time that we have uh, meetings, which is twice a month, that uh, unfortunately you know, there's only a few of the community shows up for these meetings. And uh, like I say, we have 4,500 uh, accounts in the uh, plus. Uh, of the water district and uh, only a few people show up for, for these meetings. Only when they show up, when they do show up, uh, they have personal problems with the water district. And uh, I would hope that uh, the people in the community would be in more involved with the water district than there has been. Thank you. Thomas. Holstrom, thank you. Right? Is that right? Uh, <clears throat> Thomas Fjellstum. <laughs> Is that good? No, that's close enough. I'll take any wide range of pronunciations. Uh, from Joshua Tree, uh, since vacation rentals apparently are a hot topic, um, I figured I'd come up here and speak a little bit about it. I formed a Vacation Rentals Association to help educate hosts how to be good neighbors up here. A lot of people are investing in property and doing vacation rentals and might not know about desert community and ethics and things. So um, our group is on Facebook and I encourage anybody to, who knows or is a host of a vacation rental to uh, get in touch and, and join up. It's a free kind of service that we all sort of support each other and edu educate each other on practices up here. Uh, it's joshuatreevra.com, and that'll get you all the information on how to get in touch. Uh, we also work with the county as sort of representing a group, um, uh, you know, as a group to, to represent us to work with the county. There is an ordinance in the works right now, and it's currently in a red line draft. It was put into effect into the mountain region and uh, they're working on doing some updates to it and it's going to you know i don't know how far out or the timeline is but we've uh, they've been taking comments from the community and uh, our group as well we met with don rao and had a great meeting and um and uh, hopefully that'll be coming out and i think that'll probably address a lot of issues that are that are around vacation rentals and concerns that are pe people are having with those um And uh, yeah, I also want to say I'm a bit bummed about the whole Dollar General thing, seeing the, the groundbreaking going on over there. It was a long battle, started about seven years ago. And uh, so that's a, that's a point of contention and sadness that we see. But I also want to thank the group that worked on the Altamira project. And there's apparently big, what little I know about there is a good success in having that stopped and having them start over from the beginning. 
Uh, the auto camp thing is also a big concern. I'm concerned about the uh, 55 trailers and how that's going to impact downtown. But uh, hopefully that will go through the county process and they'll be able to address everything like with the water and septic use. So thank you very much. Uh, our next meeting will be Monday, June 10th. And uh, we can't change the time of it now because we'd have to put it on the agenda. So um, let us know your concerns about the time so we can think about it and, and perhaps change the time that we meet if it's going to be more convenient for more people. Um, the other thing I just want to say is we're here to serve our communities. So please give us your input. We're, we're, we want to hear what you want us to do, and we want to put things on the agenda that you're interested in and that you want to see happen um, in, the, in your communities and in the Morongo Basin. Um, we are really here to serve, and we hope you will do that. So do I have a call to adjourn? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjourned. <laughs>